First of all, I want to welcome all the visitors we have today uh, from Academia the TKS School and, uh, of course, from the community. It's always a great pleasure to see a full audience. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor Priya Natarajan, delivering a very special talk on chasing after the first black holes in memory of the late Stephen Hawking. For the sake of the students and the young members of the, on the audience, I will share the story of Priya's first experience with research leading to a very successful career as a professor in the departments of physics and astronomy at Yale University. At a young age, let me rephrase that, at a very young age, Priya was introduced to uh, a Commodore 64. For those of you too young to know or too old to remember, Commodore 64 wa was one of the first but uh, most successful 8-bit uh, home computers. So Priya uh, learned how to program very, very quickly, and instead of searching for the latest computer games, he went to the local planetarium, begging the director of a very challenging computer-based project, problem to solve. The director being a very, very clever woman that knew Priya's obsession about celestial and terrestrial maps, suggested her to create a program able of constructing a, a star, a map, a chart of the stars above New Delhi. Six months later, six weeks later, I'm sorry, uh, Priya delivered the program in an astonished di director, not always being able to draw the night sky above New Delhi, but above any place on Earth. Nowadays, Priya is a renowned expert in particle astrophysics, and her research involves mapping the detailed distribution of dark matter in the universe, utilizing the bending of the light in route to us from distant galaxies. In particular, she has focused on making dark matter maps of clusters of galaxies, the largest known repositories of dark matter. In addition to her academic position at Yale, Priya also holds the Sophie and Tycho Brahe Professorship of the Dark Cosmology Center Niels Bohr Institute at the University of Copenhagen, uh, she has been recently elected to a honorary professorship for life at the University of Delhi. Priya was also awarded the Guggenheim Fellowship uh, and has been a GILA Fellow at the University of Colorado at Boulder, a resident fellow at the Rockefeller Bellagio Center in Italy, a visiting professor at the Institute for Theory and Computation at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, and held the Emmy Line Bigelow Conland Fellowship at Harvard's Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Most importantly, Priya was the chair of the Women's Faculty Forum from 2011 to 2013 at Yale. As she is deeply interested in institutional change with regard to gender parity in academy. If all of that was not enough, Priya has recently authored a book aimed at the curious public titled Mapping the Heavens, the Radical Scientific Ideas that Reveal the Cosmos. The book received a honorable mention in the cosmology and astronomy section and would be available for sale in a signing session after, the, after this le le uh, lecture. So I really cannot think of a better speaker to explain Hawking's contribution to the field as well as her own. I would like to, to close by one of uh, Hawking's most uh, famous quotes. So we're about to hear his master voice 
at an interview that he had given not so many years ago uh, in an ABC News interview. Here are the most important pieces of advice I've passed on to my children. One, remember to look up at the stars and not down at your feet. Two, never give up work. Work gives you meaning and purpose and life is empty without it. It's beautiful advice. Three, if you are lucky enough to find love, remember it is rare and don't throw it away. So, without further ado, let's give it up for Professor Priya Nataraj. So first I want to say um, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, it's a real pleasure and a privilege to have this opportunity to talk to you uh, about where we are in our understanding of some of the most enigmatic objects in the universe, black holes. A lot of the work that I will be talking about has stemmed from early work done by Stephen Hawking and many other astrophysicists. So um, first, I would like to, um, I had the distinct honor and pleasure and privilege of learning from both um, Stephen and Donald Lyndon Bell, who made incredible contributions to the studies of black holes, and they both passed away last year. So um, I'd like to acknowledge my debt to them for getting me into the subject, keeping me excited. Um, okay, so um, first I have to say that I'm really, really excited to see um, all of you in the audience, in particular, a lot of young women and girls. Um, thank you. And what I want to show to you all is that although we understand quite a bit about black holes, there are lots of open problems. So it's up to you to find something new and exciting. And I hope to outline some of the open questions um, at the end of my talk. So I'm starting here by acknowledging and just listing to you the names of many people who are currently active working on the first black holes. There's been a lot of activity on trying to understand how the first black holes form, how we might be able to detect them and confirm and validate some theoretical ideas that we have. So, but before that, um, I have to confess that, uh, as you probably gathered from Christos's uh, introduction to me, uh, I'm actually a bit of a map nut. So I love maps, and, and I think the, what I like about maps is that they chart and they reveal to you our changing understanding of the universe. So one of my, so I want to start off with showing you some maps that have shaped conceptions of the cosmos to give you the context in which we understand black holes as astronomical objects. So these are some of my favorite maps. Um, first is the Nebraska disk, which dates back to 2000 to 1600 BCE. So probably human beings, from the first moment they could stand up uh, and look at the night sky, have been wondering what the night sky is about, why there are these regular patterns in the night sky, and what the nature of these various objects that they see in the night sky. So we have no idea why this uh, Nebraska disk was found in the Saxony-Anhalt region of Germany. We have no idea. It looks like the Pleiades cluster, the sun, the moon, and we have no idea what this was used for. It was probably a notebook, an observational notebook, probably the, one of the first recorded uh, notebooks. The second is uh, from a civilization, the Mesopotamian civilization, that is one of my favorites, and this is a cuneiform tablet, and we've deciphered it, and that actually notes the positions of the planet Venus in the night sky. So you, at this point, you should all gasp, because this was 7th century BC, and they already knew the difference between a planet and a star, so that's really remarkable. And then you see uh, probably um, a chart that is familiar to most of you. It's Al-Sufi's 14th century a book of constellations and of fixed stars. And so there was a lot of interest, excitement, curiosity around the world, across cultures, about the night sky. 
And just as people were mapping terrestrially the Earth, they were mapping the night sky as well. And so these are two maps of the world of terra firma that you're probably quite familiar with. So I think one of the things that really interests me is the transition from just charting what you see to looking for an explanation, an explanation in scientific terms that we have now come to understand. So this is one of the earliest maps where we see this evidence of this transition, and this is one of the reasons I love maps. We can read a lot of what was going on in terms of the current understanding at that time. So here for the first time, you have two angels that are turning the crank. So we're looking for an explanation for night and day and the seasons, right? So this is one of the first maps where you see that you're not just sort of taking note of what's happening in the night sky, but you're actually looking for an explanation. And this is another of my favorite maps. And this is um, the Catalan Atlas from the 1300s uh, from Spain. What is incredible about this map is the move towards the marriage of ideas and instruments. So you can all immediately see there's an astrolabe that now appears everywhere in the corner of this map. So there's a transition of moving from mere ideas and speculation, looking for explanations, and for making measurements, right? So I think, and of course, indisputably, one of the major reorderings of the cosmos, well, the cosmos at that time was just our, our solar system, was Ptolemy's 1543, moving the pivot of the solar system from the Earth to the Sun. So this set in motion, this radical idea set in motion and has brought us all the way to our current understanding of the cosmos. And so this is where we are at today. We know the uh, age of the universe to a pretty high degree of precision, and we also know the sequence of events, how the universe was born, how it grew, evolved, how all the objects, including the black holes that I'm going to talk about, their place in cosmic history, when the first black holes formed, and how they grow, and how they have evolved over time, how galaxies assemble. That entire cosmic story is extremely well understood, although we still have a lot of open questions, right? And so one, this is to probably presage John's talk um, for later this um, afternoon. So one of the things that we know a lot, so you know, I want to show you what we know and what we don't know. So I want to simultaneously keep showing you that we've understood quite a lot about the cosmos, about black holes, but then there are many, many open questions still. So for example, we know the detailed cosmic inventory of the universe, we know the composition, so all the stuff that we're made of, everything in the periodic table is that 4.6%. So most of the matter of the un in the universe is dark matter. We don't know what it's made of. We know it's some kind of particle. We have no idea what particle. Most of the energy content of the universe that causes the universe to expand in an accelerating fashion is driven, propelled by this repulsive force called dark energy, we don't know what it is. We know what it does, we don't know what it is, right? So there are many, many open questions. So let me move on now after this brief introduction and cosmic context for black holes to tell you about where we are with black holes and the transition, the way in which the idea of black holes became accepted. It was first challenged and then it was accepted and then there's been enormous progress. And as I said, a lot of... Um, the work that I'm going to show you is going to be from the astrophysics, astronomical point of view that's supported by observation, but much of the theoretical framework in understanding black holes was, of course, laid by Hawking and many other um, astronomers and astrophysicists. So the, the two particular people that I mentioned, Stephen Hawking, Donna Lyndon Bell, and I also want to give a shout out to Subramaniam Chandrasekhar, an Indian astrophysicist who in the 1930s to 1950s figured out um, the origin, the astrophysical origin for black holes. So let me just take you on this journey and show you a little bit more about how black holes actually became real. And you'll see what I mean in just a moment. So um, for a very long time, black holes were merely a mathematical curiosity. So they were a solution to Einstein's famous field equations 
that he proposed in his theory of general relativity. So what he did was radically reconceptualize Newton's idea of gravitation. So Newton's laws tell you that you have two bodies that have masses, they, have, they feel an attractive force, and Newton gave us a description of what that force was. Newton could not tell us what the origin of the force was and why there was this force. And that's what Einstein revolutionized. He showed us, he presented this theory of general relativity in 1915. It was a very complex theory. And however, it was a mathematical theory that made concrete predictions, so it could be tested. And in fact, one of the reasons why Einstein uh, became a celebrity overnight was because of the confirmation of this theory with the total solar eclipse that happened. So what did Einstein actually do? So this picture really captures how he reconceptualized gravity and created a sort of a geometric interpretation for gravity that tells you what the role of matter is, of mass is in the universe. So Einstein postulated that the universe was a four-dimensional sheet, a sheet with three spatial dimensions and the dimension of time, and that the way this space-time sheet and our universe, there's nothing above it, there's nothing below it, we all live on this sheet. And in fact, anything that has matter, that has mass, matter in the universe, would create a little pockmark, would create a pothole in this sheet. And the more massive an object, the more massive this pothole would be. And so what he did was relate, the, completely change the relationship between matter and geometry. Right? And this could be tested. So the fact that you make this pothole could be tested when you have um, a total solar eclipse. So Einstein predicted that when you have a sol total solar eclipse, the Earth, sun, um, Earth and Sun line up. And so what you end up seeing is because of this pothole that is generated, remember the universe is just this sheet, so light has to travel, light has to track every little pothole before it comes to us from distant objects. So if you have stars that are um, beyond the sun in this case, and because the sun is now between the earth and those distant stars, you have a huge deep pothole like the one that we see there. And so light gets deflected because it has to come through the pothole. And so when you no longer have the solar eclipse, remember, you don't have that pothole. That pothole has moved. Solar eclipse is a particular lineup, right? So then you actually see the stars are not in the same position that you saw them to be when there was the pothole because light was bent when it was coming through the pothole. So Einstein precisely predicted what that difference would be in the apparent position of a star during an eclipse and when there's no eclipse. And he was dead on right. Okay, so that was sort of the first um, proof of his theory. So before I tell you a little bit more about how black holes fit into that theory, um, I want to sort of mention that this idea of a black hole or a dark star predates Einstein. So actually, even in the 1700s, when Newtonian theory of light, light was believed to be made of corpuscles, particles, right? So light was actually thought to be made of particles. So it was believed that if you had a star that was really massive, it could attract like particles and then prevent them, just capture them because of gravity. So that star itself would capture light and would become very dark. This is not quite what a black hole is, but it's getting close, right? It's kind of similar in the sense that black holes do not uh, glow and produce their own light. So but this, you know, then it turns out, and I'll show you, just for those of you who are interested, just to show you how elegant Einstein's equations are, I'll just flash that equation for you. And a black hole solution is a solution to that equation. Einstein never imagined that his really complex equation would actually have an exact solution. So when the solution was found by Carl Schwarzschild, he kind of dismissed it. He said, well, yeah, this is a mathematical curiosity. It cannot correspond to anything real in the universe, because as we'll see, it's a very perverse object with bizarre properties. And you can imagine people thought that it couldn't really be real. But it turns out that black holes are very real, as I'm going to show you. And their reality was established when pulsars were discovered in the 1960s and with the discovery of quasars. So we'll talk a little bit more about them later. 
But um, you know, I started writing this book about mapping and cartography and all the latest ideas in cosmology. And little did I know that when I was writing the chapter on black holes, that there would be a connection to India. So it turns out that the term black hole has a terrible origin. It comes from the name given to a prison in which soldiers from the East India Company were imprisoned overnight and nobody made it out. So it was a point of no return. So that was the idea of a black hole. And remember, this is predates the astronomical, astrophysical idea or Einstein's equations or anything. So because, and so this term got used to uh, describe these objects, which were basically objects which are a point of no return for any matter or any light, as we will see. So one of the uh, features of Einstein's equations was that he was able to describe, with this relationship between geometry and matter, he was able to describe all kinds of systems in the universe. You know, black holes, planetary systems, in fact, the entire universe right, could be described. The entire universe was believed to be the space-time, and all the matter in the universe, solar systems, planets, galaxies, everything can be thought of as generating little potholes. So we lived in a little pockmarked universe, and light is whizzing through all these po uh, potholes and arriving at us. So he, Einstein was able to show that mass creates this curvature, these potholes in space, and the space curvature, in turn, determines how masses move. So in a way, he was able to show this is what gravity really is. Gravity is this interrelationship between matter and the shape of space. So this is just, uh, don't get scared, this is the only scary equation um, in the talk, but I, it's such a beautiful equation that I could not resist showing you this, right? So this, these are Einstein's equations. There are 10 equations that are hidden in this, right? And so this, this was his breakthrough. He was able to relate the curvature or the shape of space to the total energy content, so all the mass, matter in the universe. And if there was some other sort of you know, ground state energy, vacuum energy, a baseline energy for the universe, he made room for that too, right? So what is amazing about this equation is that this equation describes the properties of the entire universe. I mean, this is how grand this theory is, right? And it explains the propagation of light in the universe and light bending. And it predicts the existence of black holes in the universe. Okay, so what are black holes? I've kind of skirted around and sort of, you know, I'm sort of teasing you. And so let's see, okay, what's a black hole? There are many different ways of thinking about a black hole. So the first sort of simplest way that is probably familiar to all of you is that a black hole is the end state of massive stars in the universe. So you have a star that is eight to ten times more massive than our sun, lives out its life, exhausts all its nuclear fuel, explodes, leaves behind a little remnant black hole, a very compact, dense, super dense object, and that's a black hole. But there's some other very peculiar properties that are really fun about black holes. Well, I find them fun. They're very non-intuitive, but they're really cool to bend your mind around. So one way to think about black holes is to think about this idea of it's a place of no escape, right? Nothing, no matter, not even light can escape it. So, for example, you have seen when satellites are launched, say, from Cape Canaveral, um, and you have to boost a rocket to escape the gravity of Earth, right? And so you have to boost it around 11.2 kilometers per second. That's why you have these rocket boosters, to free you from the gravitational field of the Earth, right? So just imagine, so for the Earth to launch a satellite, you need about 11.2 kilometers a second. For a black hole, if you had to launch something out of it, has to exceed the speed of light. So the escape velocity from a black hole has to be greater than the speed of light. And since the speed of light is the cosmic speed limit. There's nothing that can exceed the speed of light. Basically, nothing can exit a black hole, not even light. So that's the way to understand. So it's the grip of gravity. The gravity of a black hole is so intense that you actually cannot escape it. Okay? And so, for example, and it's also it's a very compact object, and one way to think about it is if the Earth was to behave and have the intense gravity of a black hole, you would have to scrunch all of us on Earth to a size of less than one centimeter. That's, when, that's how compactly we'd have to be packed to have the same gravity, 
the intense gravity of a black hole. So one of the interesting things about a black hole is that it has the sacred boundary. It has a boundary called the event horizon. So the event horizon, it's called the Schwarzschild radius in honor of the person who found this exact solution uh, to Einstein's equation that describes the space around a black hole, as we'll just see in a minute. So there's a, there's a fixed radius that depends on the mass of a black hole. That's called the Schwarzschild radius. And this is the radius of no return. So once any matter, any light goes in there, there's no return, right? And so that's the Schwarzschild radius. And so if, I had to, if you had to, again, imagine the sun had to have the intense gravity of a black hole, you'd have to pack the entire sun into a size of about three kilometers, right? So just to give you a sense of how compact it needs to be. Another way of thinking about the black hole now is to connect them back to these Einstein's equation solutions. So if you look at flat space, so that's space-time, if there was no matter in the universe, the universe would be flat. And imagine now we have the sun, so we saw the pothole that's generated by the sun. Now look at the pothole that's generated by a neutron star, which is much more compact than the sun. It's much more tightly packed and much more dense. So notice it's causing a deeper pothole. A black hole causes a puncture in space-time. It punches the hole. And the reason it punches the hole is in the center of a black hole, you have a singularity. And what's the singularity? This is the incredible, uncomfortable, tantalizing, seductive part of a black hole. It's the point where all known laws of physics break down. So it's the singularity is enclosed within the event horizon. So there's a singularity where everything that we know actually breaks apart. So these are some of the features of what a black hole is and the black hole solution. So the black hole solution to Einstein's equations, as I mentioned, has this event horizon or Schwarzschild radius that is shown as a dashed line there. And so as I, any matter light that passes that dashed line is captured. But then there's an interesting radius outside that's about one and a half times the Schwarzschild radius where light could be caught perpetually orbiting. Okay, it will be captured. And then, of course, if you're farther away from the black hole, then farther and farther away, the gravitational intensity, the field intensity of the grip of the black hole falls off. And so you could just whiz past, right? You could be at a safe distance and just whiz past. But what's very interesting is I want you to note that light that orbits and is captured, right, and skirting the black hole will form a kind of silhouette or shadow around a, the black hole. The black hole itself does not produce any light. So we will see a black hole. We will see the influence a black hole exerts on its vicinity, on light in its vicinity, and on objects that stray close, right? An object strays very close, like light, it will be captured into the black hole. So um, another feature of black holes is that black holes can also be spinning. So you can have a black hole that is spinning. So if you have a spinning black hole and a non-spinning black hole, the only difference is how far out the event horizon is. Okay? And the reason I mention that uh, is because um, that's one sort of frontier trying to measure the spins of black holes. It's a big open question. We're all very excited about the ways in which you can do that. So since the theme of um, this year's uh, web is time, one of the amazing things about black holes is that the nature of time changes around them. So time slows down near a black hole. I know this is pretty mind-bending. Uh, this is why these are crazy objects. And so if you had somebody who had the unfortunate fate of falling into a black hole, you don't want that. It's a pretty extreme event. Um, and you had someone was an observer, distant observer, cautious, safe observer, they would find time ticking differently near a black hole, very close to the black hole. Okay, so now that I've given you a flavor for all the bizarre properties of black holes, this is one of the reasons many of us are excited to work on black holes. Um, let me show you that they're real, right? So the first black holes that were detected um, where this first supermassive black hole. So supermassive black holes are basically black holes that are a million times the mass of the sun. And we now believe that most, if not all, galaxies harbor a central supermassive black hole sitting in the center. And black holes come in two states. 
So you could either have black holes like the one in the center of our own galaxy, which is shown here, um, as a little blip there. Um, that's the location of the black hole. It's not glowing. It's just a location right next to the location of the black hole. There's a star that you can see glowing. So that's what is marked here. And so this black hole is just sitting there doing nothing. It's fasting. Okay? It's not eating. It's fasting. Quasars, on the other hand, are some of the brightest beacons in the universe. These are very bright objects. They are powered by feasting black holes. So these are supermassive black holes that are feeding from a lot of gas that is right around them. And they actually glow. So what is really glowing is not the black hole, but the gas that is getting captured on its way to the black hole. It gets heated up, it gets, starts glowing in the x-rays and in optical, and you start seeing the quasar. So you see the dying gasps of gas as it's falling into a black hole, and that's how black holes reveal themselves. Okay? And so quasars have been discovered now to, at great distances. So before I move on to talking to you more about quasars and distant black holes, I want to give a shout out to a new project. Watch this space in a couple of months. Remember I told you right around the black hole, light gets bent in this photon radius where light is captured forever. For the black hole in the center of the Milky Way, we are poised to measure this kind of picture from the light that is captured around it. And this project is called the Event Horizon Telescope. They've taken the data in a three months or so. You should see these incredible images up close. This is the closest we will ever get to any black hole, Okay, the image. And so we should see, this is a simulation. So this is the kind of thing we want to see, we are most likely to see. And of course, this is a test of Einstein's theory. So far, Einstein has gotten full marks on all the tests, right? So, but, if, but we know that Einstein's theory is not complete, that there's probably an extension to, to his theory, or an overlapping theory, a theory that covers him, uh, covers his work, and explains even more, and marries quantum mechanics, the physics of the smallest objects, to astronomical cosmic objects. So that theory we know has remained elusive. So if we don't see this, it'll point us to something uh, perhaps fundamentally different and super exciting. So bright quasars, as I mentioned, are growing supermassive black holes. So here is an inventory. Here's some data. So all the dots are data. So these are all quasars. In the gray are dead black holes, the guys that are fasting, like the one in the Milky Way. So that's the nearby universe. The x-axis that you see on the horizontal, it's an astronomer's way of measuring time. And that's going back in time. So zero is today. We go back in time. And the reason we do that is, as you all know, one of the amazing facts about the universe is that when you go out and you look into the universe, you are looking back in time. You're looking at the universe as it was earlier, right? So this chart shows you all the colored uh, dots and um, symbols that you see are quasars that we know about. So supermassive growing black holes that exist in the universe. And so I've suggestively, provocatively drawn this little yellow elongated ellipse to show you on the y-axis is the mass, how big the black hole is. Just notice the numbers, billion, billion times the mass of the sun. So these are some monster black holes that are already living in the universe when the universe was very, very young. So the number eight there corresponds to when the universe was 10% of its current age. The current age of the universe is 13.8 billion years, right? So we have some accounting to do here. So we have these monsters already in place very, very early on in the universe. So where else can you find black holes? So black holes, so this is an image from the Chandra satellite, which measures the X-ray emission from the dying gasps of gas that are being swallowed by black holes. So what you see here as little red dots are growing little black holes in the center right around the inner regions of a galaxy. So it appears that the universe is littered with black holes with supermassive black holes, with tiny black holes that are the end states of stars and so on. So the question is, where do you find black holes? So we started out, I'll play this movie again. We started out with the real Hubble Space Telescope image of a nearby galaxy, and we are moving into the heart. And this is, of course, an artist's impression. Remember, I told you we've never come that close to a black hole. 
But we do know that the way black holes feed gas is the gas settles down into a nice feeding disk around black holes, and then it starts to trickle in. So black holes, um, we believe, inhabit pretty much every galaxy. And for the nearby galaxies, we have found black holes to be um, dead. I don't, I'm not able to play it again. OK. So, but where is the most compelling evidence for a black hole? It actually comes from the center of our galaxy. What you're going to see here is one of the most remarkable set of astronomical observations. These are the motions. You'll be seeing the motions of stars. This is real data, okay? Motions of stars around the center of our galaxy. Notice that we're measuring, that, that's the clock that tells you the date for the data, and you're measuring the full orbit of these stars. And all of you know from Kepler's laws that apply to the solar system, you apply them there, you know that the focus is where the black hole is. Right? And so this thing is a little gas blob that we all got very excited about uh, that came pretty close to a black hole. We thought, ah, oh, we'll see a swallowing event. It didn't swallow. It missed. So it's going to come back later, and there's going to be a lot of activity. So this is a prediction from a simulation for the future. But what do we know about how black holes grow? So this is the cross-section of that accretion disk that I showed you, the artist's impression, the red stuff that I showed you earlier. So this is from um, a very high-resolution simulation. So what you see is gas that is flowing in. So the black hole is at the center there, and the gas starts to trickle in and to feed the black hole. And so this is a simulation from one of my former graduate students. So these. Black holes grow by feeding gas that falls into them. They also grow by crashing into each other. So we, what we saw here are two spiral galaxies, rather like ours, sort of unremarkable gas rich like the Milky Way galaxies, both of which harbor a black hole in the center. And you can see they're feeding when they're flickering. They're flickering means they're actually feeding gas. And galaxies in the universe grow by actually merging and colliding with each other. So the early universe was an extremely violent place. Things were crashing into each other. And you make bigger galaxies by crashing small galaxies into each other. So obviously, when you crash galaxies, the black holes in their centers also collide. They combine, and they make a bigger black hole. I'll come back to um, some of the observational tests of that picture as I uh, move on. So this is from an old simulation that we did. So this is a top-down view of an accretion disk. So the red thing is a gas disk. In the center, you have a very massive, supermassive black hole. And then we are dropping a black hole from the top, which was we are now zooming into the heart of what I just showed you earlier. We saw these two galaxies. Now we're zooming right into the center. So this is work that we did um, many years ago where we showed that the role of gas is very important in actually getting these two black holes to finally crash into each other. And what you see as the secondary black hole is moving inside into the primary is that it sets up these waves. It sets up these shocks in the disk. Those yellow bits are things that you can see in light, in the x-rays, in the infrared. So you can actually catch two black holes trying to merge with each other. So some of the other peculiar things about black holes are that, remember I told you that every galaxy harbors a black hole in its center. It turns out that the mass of the stars in the innermost region of a galaxy are somehow correlated to the mass of the black hole. And so this tells you that somehow the inner part of the galaxy and the black hole assemble perhaps together. They have something to do with each other, right? They modulate each other's growth. And so this is something we have to explain. So that's one of the big open questions that people like me have been working on for a decade, to really unravel this connection between star formation and black hole growth. Okay. So let me now move on to talking um, to you about the various channels to make black hole seeds, like the first black hole. As I mentioned, the most sort of traditional way that we have believed black holes form, black hole seeds form, is when you have a population three is an early first star that forms in the universe, and it can die, and it can leave you a little black hole seed. Or you could have a cluster of stars that forms in the early universe. All those stars die. They leave little black holes, and those black holes crash into each other, and they give you a bigger seed black hole. Or 
As we proposed with one of my postdocs in 2005 and 6, we worked on this new model of direct collapse black holes, where basically you have a gas disk that starts to go unstable, and in, this is before the formation of any star in the very early universe, and gas starts to skirt in, fall to the center, and you must have all seen this, right? You're sitting in a bathtub, you pull the plug out, and you see the water swiveling in very rapidly into a little vortex. It's the same kind of instability that you have. It's an instability in the water. And so you have a similar instability in the very early universe, and that can form, that'll send a lot of matter. Basically, to make a black hole, you need to siphon a lot of matter to a very small volume. So you end up doing that. And we argued that you could make some very, very massive seed black holes. Black holes are like 10 to the 4, 10 to the million times the mass of the sun from the get-go. You don't have to start with a piddly thing and slowly grow it. You can make a really monster black hole to start with. And only now we are starting to be able to see that process in simulations. So these are extremely high-resolution, um, sophisticated simulations where we're looking at gas. And what you see, those inner regions are regions where you would have that kind of compact object um, that forms. So this is all great to talk about theoretical ideas, but you know, can you test them? So it turns out that um, a space telescope that is going to be launched very soon, in another couple of years, the James Webb Space Telescope, it turns out is designed exactly to uncover the first black holes. So it stands to test these various models that I just showed you. So let me um, now go show you a little bit, because I want you to want to give you a feel of exactly what an astrophysicist like me does. Like, what are we actually doing? So let me give you a glimpse of that model a little bit more. So people like me are building models. And we build models that are paper, pencil, analytic models with mathematics and physics. And then we go make simulations of them to see if they're realistic. And then you look for observational signatures. Like, can you go find this signature in the universe? Does that stage happen in the universe, right? So let me give you a bit of a flavor. So these direct collapse black holes, as I told you, they stand to be tested. So this is the test, okay? So this is the model that I've been working on for 10 years. You might say, oh, wow, this is really simple. Actually, it is simple. But the details are really what are complicated. So you start out with seed black holes. What we want to understand is discriminate between these two theories, right? One that makes small seeds, light seeds, and one that makes really massive seeds. So remember I told you that the assembly of the black hole and that of the stars around it in a galaxy are somewhat coupled to each other. So if you start with a small seed and then you make stars around it, then it turns out that you make a lot more stars than you grow the black hole. The black hole growth initially is kind of quenched. It doesn't, it doesn't grow as rapidly. Its growth is a bit stunted. Whereas if you start with a really big seed, it actually is, you know, it's like uh, overeaters become more and more obese. So this black hole will remain and grow very rapidly. And the stars, the stars are meant to be shown with this yellow ring. It shows you how many stars you have. So you find that when you have a very massive seed, you don't form as many stars. But remember, I told you that the mass of a black hole is correlated to the mass of stars. So for example, in the Milky Way, that's a correlation we are trying to explain. So when we look in the nearby universe, we see that the mass of the black hole is tiny, is a thousandth of the mass of the stars. So eventually, everybody has to end up there, right? But there's a point in between during the teenage life of growing black holes that there is a real difference that can help you figure out whether you have massive seeds or whether you have light seeds. And this is precisely, so this is just a diagram for one of, from one of our recent papers, where we show that you form this direct collapse black hole and the masses of stars is just a, a slightly more uh, schematic version of the cartoon just, that I just showed you. So an object that looks like the one at the bottom is going to have a very different observational signature from an object in which the black hole is tiny. Because remember, we will see the black hole because of the gas falling into it, and we will see the stars because they glow. But in the case of a direct collapse black hole, the growing black hole is what we're going to see. The starlight is going to be really not strong enough, right? So we can predict the spectra, 
How much energy is going to come out of that object? How much in stars? How much from the growing black hole? So just to give you a flavor for the work, don't worry about what's going on. So what, what this movie shows you is this is the energy of the light that is going to come out from that complicated object, that cocooned object with stars and a growing black hole. And so what this, all you want, I want you to see is that gray line tells you the visibility of the James Webb Space Telescope. All you need to note is note that the orange, that's the energy, is always above. So it's going to be detectable. Okay, this is something that we can actually detect. So this is another diagram that shows you that this model makes predictions. The black notches that you see are JWST instruments. And the energy that's coming out of the objects that we predict uh, exceed the observability limit. So we should be able to see these booming objects in the very early universe. And so we have, or, you know, we have a really, and you know, in fact, this is one of the goals of the James Webb Space Telescope is to uncover the first black holes. So I, people like me have been working for the last few years trying to fully complete this chain. Okay, what are the observable signatures? Can we rule out a model? Can we validate the model? What do we need, right? So because this is, I want to also show you in some sense how science works, right? This is sort of what we're doing. You can come up with a nice storyline, come up with a nice idea, you can make predictions. And what is exciting is that your predictions can be proven wrong or right. I mean, it's great that, you know, any predictions that you make are taken seriously enough to be tested. I would like to be right, but I am okay if it's wrong, right? That's science. You move on and you find something else to work on or some other aspect to work on. But I'm very excited. There is growing evidence that there are massive black hole seeds in the universe. So from other kind of predictions that I'm not showing you here, we have very good reason to believe that this model works quite well in the early universe. So um, I just wanted to show you one other nice movie that was made by one of my graduate students. So this shows you the growth history. So what you see as little stars are actually growing black holes. And what you see in the bottom is that correlation that I said between, that's a galaxy property, that's a property of the black hole. And that's once again the clock, remember the clock runs reverse. Uh, zero is today. So, and the data that you see there, the sticks that you see there are measured uh, from the nearby universe. So, you know, we make these models and remember they have to explain what we see. So this is just to show you that the models that we make actually um, explain uh, what we can see. They have to incorporate all current observations and make some extra predictions. So remember we looked at these uh, crashing uh, galaxies. So it turns out when black holes finally merge, they cause tremors in space-time. So this is the structure of space-time itself. The sort of little earthquakes that are set up. These are gravitational waves. You must have all heard about the first direct detection of gravitational waves that was made by the LIGO collaboration. It was announced a few years ago. In this case, we saw the uh, collision of two tiny black holes, right? 30 times the mass of the sun. The black holes I'm interested in are the obese cousins. They're the supermassive black holes. They merge too, and we have not yet detected them. So these are images that you would have seen of uh, the merging black hole discovered by the LIGO collaboration. And they've me detected many, many more events of merging black holes. But remember, they're all tiny black holes. The numbers on the vertical axis tell you the masses. So they're all in the 10s and the 20s and the 40s. You know, a, a graph like this that I would want to see before I die will have a million, a billion, few billions on that axis, right? So the, the black holes that are hosted. And that's coming. So before that comes, of course, we need to understand it theoretically. And so there was a major breakthrough in computer simulations in understanding gravitational waves produced by supermassive black holes colliding with each other. So these are two of the leading groups in the world, uh, Franz Pretorius and his collaborators at Princeton, and Manuela Campanelli and her collaborators at the Rochester Institute of Technology. They're two different versions. So I just wanted to show you there are many independent teams doing things independently to see if the results agreed. So they're all predicting the kinds of gravitational waves that we should detect from these supermassive black holes. And how are we going to do that? We're going to have an instrument called LISA that has been uh, proposed and is being built by the Europeans with the uh, hopeful collaboration from uh, the Americans. 
And this is an interferometer in space. It's like the LIGO experiment, just in space, because the frequency range of the supermassive black hole collisions much, much lower than that of the stellar mass black holes. So we need to be above the Earth's atmosphere to make that measurement. So what's really, what's coming in the future? Remember I told you that I want to give you a sense of what all is open and remains to be done. The legacy of Hawking, um, Chandrasekhar, Donald Lindenbell, is that we know LISA and LIGO are the two instruments uh, to detect uh, supermassive black hole collisions. There are many, many open questions about the kinds of objects, all the kinds of objects that we can detect in the universe with this new window. It's an entirely new uh, window um, into the universe. So if you want to read a little bit more um, about these ideas, this, uh, this was the cover of Scientific American in February uh, last year. Um, I wrote a piece about the first black holes. So I want to um, end here with this wonderful movie that was made by NASA that includes results from my group and from many research groups around the world that gives you a sense. Remember, I kept telling you nothing can escape a black hole, but you just see accretion. So this gives you a sense from simulations, where we are at with simulations. Uh, it's a supercomputer simulation, and the results that are seen here, they took years on a supercomputer to do. And so these are the, this is the flow of gas around a black hole. This is the feeding disk of a black hole. And it's colored pink and blue because the gas that is coming towards us is blue. The gas that's going away is pink. It's actually supposed to be red, but a uh, bit of a distortion here. And what, remember that edge that you see, the fixed edge that is not flowing? That's what the Event Horizon Telescope is going to detect. Okay? So that's the light, the photon radius. And um, if you see um, the way uh, we actually infer the presence and measure the properties of black holes is by the flow of gas in, the heated gas in x-rays. So that little schematic shows you the, the black hole is in the center, and around it is the accretion disk. What you see, the diagram is of the disk. You've cut the disk sideways. And so you see the inner photon radius that we talked about earlier. And this material that is falling in has been sped up by the intense gravity of a black hole to speeds close to the speed of light. Okay. And um, all of this we have inferred from data so far. So this is our current state-of-the-art understanding of how black holes grow. And so there are various, you know, you've all been to um, have your uh, bones x-rayed if you had a break. Uh, remember, so the x-ray wavelengths are revealing the sort of the innards of flows onto black holes. And so we also understand the physics of exactly what process, what kind of um, particle interaction actually gives you all this radiation, why this radiation has the energy that it does, and um, so that's extremely well understood. So I think the parts of the picture that remain to be understood now are the open question about the origin of the first black holes. And then I did not talk about some of the deeper questions, the physics questions that have to do with black holes that um, Stephen Hawking worked on till pretty much the end. So I want to close um, my talk with one very beautiful analogy that Stephen gave for a completely intractable problem. It's, a, it's been an intractable problem for a long time. And in fact, till the very end, he was working on this, and they've made a little bit of a breakthrough. It's not solved yet. So and that has to do with the information paradox. So this is something that Hawking has um, brought to our attention, has worked on and thought about a lot. And that is what happens to information when it crosses the event horizon. So the analogy that he had um, when he was explaining this to me once when I was a graduate student at Cambridge was that suppose you have an Encyclopedia Britannica and you want to see where Saudi Arabia is, you go look it up on the map and you read all about Jeddah, the capital, and so on and so forth, right? Then, so that's the information. It's encoded in print in a paper. We know it, right? Then you put this Encyclopedia Britannica in a box, and you burn it. Okay? It's a tight box. Nothing leaves the box. 
All the ashes are inside that box. So the information that Jeddah is the capital of Saudi Arabia, that Riyadh is part of Saudi, all that information is still in the ashes, right? We just don't know how to recover that information anymore, right? And we also don't know how that information is stored anymore. So that's what is going on inside a black hole. So that's one of the unsolved problems at the moment. And I just thought I should end with his beautiful analogy in trying to understand what the problem is, right? So this is the problem that people are trying to work on right now. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Priya, for your excellent talk. So uh, we're almost uh, over time, but we're going to accept some uh, questions. So please. Sorry, went over time a little bit. Yeah, yeah it's okay. It's okay. There's one there. Uh, yes, please. Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot see very clearly from here. Uh, thank you for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, what happens to matter and light when it uh, is absorbed into the black hole? Does anybody have any idea? Does it is it converted into something else, into dark energy? I don't know. No, not uh, unfortunately, not quite dark energy. But um, no, we don't actually know what really happens. That would be the the true answer. We think that. Remember, I told you when the black hole feeds. So when matter goes into a black hole, we think the black hole grows. So the mass of the black hole grows, so the event horizon grows, because the event horizon is proportional to the mass. So that's what I mean when I say a black hole grows, right? So matter goes in. But what form the matter is in once, who knows? Yeah. Hi. Um, you mentioned that there are uh, dead black holes or fasting black holes. I just want to know what like, situation or circumstances result in a dead black hole. Awesome. That's a great research question that many of us are working on, which is what makes a black hole start to fast, right? What makes it, moves it from fasting to feasting? So a couple of the things that we've understood, it's not fully resolved. One of the things we understand is that if a black hole is embedded in a gas disk and it cleans up and it feeds the entire disk out, right? Then, then you're done, there's no more gas in the vicinity, then it has no choice but to be fasting, to be sitting there, right? But we also have understood something very interesting and peculiar, which is black holes actually stunt their own growth. So you can have a black hole that is actively feeding, and I told you that you know, it gives out energy in the x-ray. Sometimes, if it's feeding fast enough, the amount of energy is so large that it can completely disrupt that feeding disk. It can destroy that disk and move all the gas out, empty the region out. So that way, a black hole will stunt its own growth and will become a dead black hole. So we've understood a little bit of the circumstances that might move a black hole from feasting to fasting. And we also know when two galaxies crash into each other and the black holes merge, that's feasting. You get a lot of gas down there. So we know that that circumstance leads you to a feast. So we understand a little bit about the circumstances. We don't have a full picture of all the possibilities of when you could you know, switch from one to the other. Um, yeah, so I was curious. When you showed the chart of the active versus inactive black holes, there were two things about it. One was like they were clustered in columns. Oh, that's just an and artifact of how I visualized it. OK. Uh, because uh, of the time axis, the way I've mm -hmm. scrunched things. And, and okay. I guess switch it off. OK. Yeah, the follow-up was then, yeah. is there any way that, you're not ha that we don't have an observational bias going on here? Like, oh, we it's do. It's easy to detect. Inactive black holes close, but far away. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Okay. okay. We, yeah, yeah. It's in, practically impossible to detect dead black holes that are further away. We could infer them because occasionally you would have a dead black hole um, that is fasting, but a star might stray very close and get gobbled. And then you have this event, sort of an explosion, that's called a tidal disruption event. And we found those. 
So they have revealed the presence of quiescent black holes in the farther universe. But absolutely right. There are biases where we detect these growing black holes um, earlier, at earlier times, uh, much more robustly. But then, you know, there's also this conundrum in the universe. The early universe was very gassy. It was very gas-rich, right? Very dense and gas-rich. So, you know, also the conditions for them to be growing are really more readily available then. I think there's a... Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor. Um, thank I have you. a quick question on singularity that you mentioned. Yeah. I'm a general reader of the subject, not really... Um, um, I have not, never studied this in depth. Uh, however, I understand that uh, before the Big Bang or at the moment of Big Bang, we also observe singularity, and then there is a singularity associated with black hole. So what are your thoughts? Are they similar? Can, if we understand the singularity in black hole, can we have more clarity about um, the other singularity? No idea, I okay. have to say. I think that um, there are mathematical theories, string theories, that speculate on the origin, sort of pre-Big Bang origin of the universe and the nature of the singularity, um, whether that singularity is the same as the singularity um, that is encased in black holes, who knows. You know, I think one of the reasons why black holes are kind of interesting to a lot of us is that, you know, they are really this border between what is known and what is the front, what is unknown or even unknowable, right, at this moment. So I think there was one question. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Enthusiastic. Uh, hello. Yeah. Uh, I'm just uh, curious. So uh, if you uh, have a naive formula to calculate the ra radius of uh, light uh, orbiting, mm -hmm. you will get just a Schwarzschild uh, radius. You uh, get you get one and a half times the Schwarzschild. Uh, radius. How do you get it one and a I half? I can times? show you. I can show you later why you get the. Yeah, uh, you get. Yeah. How, how, what, what to search to see the effect of how uh, how it becomes one and a half. Uh, so the the, the thing is, there's a last. This called the innermost stable orbit. So it's called the ISCO. So it's a it's a special orbit which is a stable orbit, and that has to be outside the event horizon. It cannot be the Schwarzschild radius. So I can show you how to calculate that offline. Okay, sure. thank you. I think there's one so, woman. Uh, the one more. Yeah, her. Yeah. No, no, no. Her, she's there. Uh, please, over there. Uh, I'm happy to carry on outside as well, but I, I think you know she had her hand up for a while, so. Hello? Mm -hmm. No. Is it working? It works, okay. yeah. So uh, you said that the behavior of time around the black hole changes. Um, so I'm guessing it slows down or it changes. Does that mean the black hole is consuming time? Or like, does it time stop inside the black hole? Since it's also a ripping space, maybe it's also a ripping time? Yeah, no, no, that's a great question. So what we think happens as you go deeper and deeper into a black hole is time and space switch. OK. I, I can, we can talk offline a little bit more about what that really means. But yeah, it's one of the incredible peculiarities of what's happening right around a black hole. OK. There is one more question here. Sure. Uh, okay. So the photon ring you showed where the photons are permanently caught in the ring uh, yeah. because of gravity. How can we see that if they don't escape the ring? How can they reach the telescope? So that's No, the no, they are still, they, they form the ring, so we are imaging them from far away, so we can still see the ring. And okay. the, the should, yeah. Shouldn't the photons reach our telescope for us to see that? They do. So the photons from the photon ring will be in the radio wavelengths, as it turns out. These are going to actually be in the radio wavelengths. And they can be seen. And they are seen for the black hole in the center of the Milky Way if the radio dish is the size of the Earth. You need a dish that is the size of the Earth. So that's what's clever about this experiment. They combined a lot of radio telescopes to create an equivalent telescope, radio telescope, that has a dish size the size of the entire Earth. And that's how they're able to resolve it. Let me suggest that we have just one more question, and I would like to invite you to continue this very nice discussion in the opening uh, of the LHC, the Large, Large Hadron Collider Tunnel, uh, that's going to be uh, today at 2. So let me also remind you that uh, we have the extreme pleasure to host 
uh, the legendary John Ellis is going to give a keynote uh, lecture uh, later on tonight uh, on uh, uh, what are we, where do we came from, where are we going? So I suggest that everybody is going to be here for this uh, keynote lecture as well. Is there any more question? The last one. So in, in uh, this case, uh, Priya, I really want to thank you oh, for thank your you excellent so effort. Oh, wow. Very good. Is that your, uh, uh, yeah.